as you as you've seen at the start there for those who are viewing uh you can see <coughs> oh cracky i'm mostly not ill now by the way uh yeah yeah a little tease as to what we're going to be going through um yeah, it's episode 151 how does modal shift work uh hello good evening uh, lovely to see you all uh, let me know if the sound is working, which it is on my dashboard, uh, as ever. Hello to those listening in audio-only form. Hello, podcast listeners. Hello, hello to those in podcast land. Um, episode 151, right. Um, of course, first thing we have to do is is give a shout-out to the Class 151, the prototypical and sadly never built, uh, or not, not, not what didn't go into production, um, Class 151 for hard retro vibes and uh, generally looking pretty awesome. I think this 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 look this aspect possibly made its way full circle onto the class 143s and the 323s actually I think some of the styling uh, uh, approach did that but a uh, big fan of of the 151 the the, D, the the futuristic looking awesome DMU that never was anyway yeah so um so shout out to that other than that uh hello uh, hello uh Jacko Huki, uh, forgive me for potentially not pronouncing your name remotely correctly, but um, hi, the long-time listener here, first time in the chat. Hello. Um, uh, oh, there should be sound. I'm I'm sending sound to you. Sound is, 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 is working its way into the chat. The chat's always a little bit behind, isn't it? Good, fine. Everyone's here and can, can hear me. Right, anyway, uh, yeah, shout out to everyone on strike, uh, by the way, as well. Uh, solidarity to everyone out there striking today, who's, who's been out there striking today. Um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, there's probably some weird YouTube grumpiness in that it was live but not live. YouTube, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? What are you doing, YouTube? Why are you doing that? Anyway, right. Uh, you don't have me waffling. Let's get on with it. Um, Welcome to tonight's uh, Rail Hour, everyone. And as the Intercity 225 fades away... Uh, you'll have to just listen to the start again if it's if it's been weird. Ah, oh, we are tonight going to be going through um, this this little this little paper this little report, which is um, it's called Modal Shift Matters and HS2 delivers it. Uh, so it's going to talk about HS2 and Modal Shift and how they tie together. Um, it's an interesting thing because it'll be interesting to pick through what perhaps it doesn't say as much as what it does say. Um, but we'll do. It's going to be a super easy, probably quite quick uh, page turn. Um, but it's worth, yeah, it should be interesting. This this was from January last year, in fact. I, I kind of scooped it, um, uh, scooped it into um, uh, the, uh, yeah, I scooped, oh, I'm glad the pronunciation was okay. Um, I scooped it into, as a, for a future natter, and then kind of ignored it for a year because shenanigans. But um, uh, I thought we'd pick through it. Before we do that, though, it's worth caveating all of this. Oh, also, get my miniaturized face in the corner. Hello, it's me. Hi. Um, the uh, yeah, we'll, we'll caveat this by going who who is who is High Speed Rail Group? What is that? Um, because two bodies actually wrote this uh, this this paper. Actually, it was written by one person, which is it, it was written by Green Gauge um, Green Gauge Twenty One. It was written by these folks here uh, here Green Gauge Twenty One. Um, and um, it was kind of procured for them by High Speed Rail Group. Now, we have to talk about these because it's right whenever you look at a report. You know, it's a page turn, but I thought I'd give some context. Whenever I look at a report, I want to know who's written it, why they've written it, who paid them to write it, all these things. And, you know, this is a report that's saying things that I say. It's saying positive things that generally back up what I'm saying, which, if anything, is more reason to check why, you know, who's written it and, and what's behind it so that you can interrogate it, ensure that you're not just uh, allowing confirmation bias to support what you're saying. So very important. Uh, I pronounced pronunciation wrong. I think you find I pronounced pronunciation perfectly. Um, uh, thanks, RWL 2012. Anywho, so, um, firstly, Green Gauge 21. Green Gauge 21 is easy because it was established back... Uh, f f I've, I've put the text on here. You don't have to look at it. I, I hate texty slides, but this is just here for anyone who wants to kind of read the detail. But basically, they've, they've existed since 2006, founded by Jim Steer of Steer Group. Um, and it's basically a bit like what permanent rail engineering was slash slightly is, although it's fading away. Um, which is that it was a not-for-profit 
intended to kind of corral people to do research that supported in, in Green Gauge 21's case it was about high speed rail you know permanent rail engineering is a bit broader than that Green Gauge 21 was kind of corralling research um, as a bit of a personal interest hobby horse for Jim Steer but a tool to sort of do that undertake this research to kind of provide support policy support for policy makers lobby support for lobbyists and then they established basically green grace 21 then weirdly established high speed rail group which then spun off and became an autonomous thing that was in 2012 so six years later that then fed back into um getting green gauge 21 to do stuff so the, 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 these two are kind of one and the same thing but but a, a little um a little bit of a, uh, a connection with the two. High Speed Rail Group is more of a lobby group and a bit of a paid club, as you'll see in a second. So there's, they represent companies. They represent kind of, you'd argue they have a personal and financial stake in there being more High Speed Rail. So you have to treat the, 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 the stuff that High Speed Rail Group, you have to treat it with a pinch of salt. But they've commissioned several good papers. There's one that, that um, uh, Rafe Smith, or Rafe Smythe, sorry, Rafe, uh, did about the environmental benefits of HS2 that the high-speed rail, back when they were high-speed high speed rail industry leaders, is what it used to be called now, it's high-speed rail group. Um, that, 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 you know, it was a good paper. So again, yes, they're, they're pushing for high-speed rail, but, but, but you know, so, so they're, 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 the point of them is to support, promote, and champion the development of high-speed rail in Great Britain. Yeah, fine. Key thing to look at, though, is the list of, of, of full big cash company members of high-speed rail group. Um, the fee is 12 grand, and you've got, well, who's in there? Arup, Design engineers, Hitachi build trains, Alston build trains, EKFB build railways, Costain build railways, Strabag build tunnels and railways, Align JV part of HS2 con contractor thing, Atkins a consultancy, RIA is a is the railway lobby group, Bombardier make trains, Siemens make trains, Jacobs design railways, Acom design railways, Colas build railways, Skanska build railways, HS1 runs high speed one. Sistra designs railways, Mott designs railways, Kelpray builds railways, Talis does signalling, SPL Powerlines electrifies railways, Avanti operates trains and is the shadow operator for HS2, Talent builds stuff, BBV is a another builder, Arcadis is my employer, they are a design consultancy, and Unipart Rail also provide maintenance stuff for railways. So a big list of people who would, let's face it, benefit from more investment in railways. You've got to frame this this report in, in this sense. So contact, very important to pay attention to that. But kind of naturally a group that is a lobby group for High Speed Rail is going to have these people involved. You can't exclude, like the context is important. So you've got to kind of read through and, and have that in the back of your head, but really important. Uh, Chris McKenna is saying no subtitles are available. Is it something I can sort out as a YouTube thing? It, <clears throat> Usually there are simultaneous uh, instantaneous subtitles. Why are those not working? YouTube's done a load of changes to the website recently. Um, it might be that they don't work until afterwards. Um, hi, Matt Reed. A pleasure to have you along. Um, hello to both of you as well. Hi, Jennifer, if you're watching. Um, uh, so, the yeah, the, the subtitles. I don't know. I'm sorry about that, Chris. Uh, forgive me. I don't know quite why that's that's happening. Very annoying. Uh, YouTube, yeah, the, lots of stupid changes recently, like particularly the one where you can't look at rail as easily as all the video list of videos now. You have to go to like uploaded, which means they're all out of sync. If you want to watch YouTube, uh, want to watch Rail Natters back, the best thing to do is to go to the go to my channel page and then go down to the playlists and then go through the playlists because each Rail Natter gets added to the main Rail Natter playlist. In fact, you know what? Stuff it. This is it. Okay, brief interlude after we've talked about before we talk about the report. Brief interlude to talk about Rail Natter admin because. Uh, this has been irritating that it's happened recently. Let's let's go in here and just... So, uh, the best thing to do is go to the channel. Oh, who's got notifications from... Oh, it's John Burns. Oh, gosh. I'm just going to... You can, you can watch me um, just mute him. I don't, don't, don't care what his comments are. Anyway, he's, he's, he was a Twitter idiot, and now he's being on YouTube and, and an idiot as well. Sorry, John Burns, but uh, shout out, John. Your persistence and your stupidity know no bounds. Uh, anyway... Look, we're live. Isn't that marvellous? So if you want to catch up on Rail Matters, and so annoyingly, look, they've done this thing where you go to videos and you can't see all the videos. It's very irritating that it's just now it's just the uploaded videos. Some might be, of you might be like, oh, I'm glad of this, but I find that irritating because for me, all videos, particularly when I use streaming to do a lot of my videos, now you've got to go to live and that's not a complete list. So the best thing to do is if you go to home and then go to Rail Matter and, and click here, um, you will have... Do, 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 do. All of the rail natters ever are in here, so you can go in. Um, there are ninety nine, and they're all here. There's the purple one, and then the, the white one, and then the red one, and and here we are down in, in one fifty one. So so you can do that. Um, 
Uh, this, this is not an ad. I don't know what. This is just a bit of a, a, a bit of some some useful admin for for those of you who uh, for whom it's useful for to be able to navigate this sort of thing. But um, if I you know I can't go back because I, uh, channel. Um, but the other playlists are here as well, which are the Rail Matter collections. So if you want to go to all the guest episodes, then you can do that. You can go so in. So I'm just gonna. Oh, look, it's me and, and Mike Muldoon back in the day when I had no idea how to deal with how to end episodes with guests. But all the guest episodes are in there. Um, likewise, if you go to um, yeah, some of the others, like that episode on policy. I've not done a million, so my sorting is quite a specific. Um, I don't know how to get rid of that little player now. Anyway, uh, so like all the history ones are kind of in here. There's, there's a few collections, like skills. There's, there's not a huge number of skills one. I need to do more skills ones, actually. Um, myths, challenges, miscellaneous. Yeah, lots of lots of stuff in there that you can uh, go in and have a look at. Like all the ones that are on, I think all the engineering ones are like... Um, on that or episode. Yeah, that's the 158 uh, episode. Um, yeah, like all the engineering ones are ones where I talk about specific engineering type things. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, so there's, there's a lot of a lot of fun stuff there for you um, trying to make. Um, yeah, to, to, if if you want to navigate rail matches, you can can do that um, fairly easily, I think and hope. Uh, so there you are, bit of bit of a. And, and while you're there, um, feel free always to to go in and like and and uh, you know like and, and and subscribe and oh we're trying to get to ten thousand subscribers as well sorry i don't know why this has gone into a bit of a bit of a self ref, ref, self-indulgent discussion about admin but hopefully it's making your lives easier to have these um playlists uh some youtube channels have resorted to a short instruction video for the rearranged tabs yeah i can i can believe it um anyway so oh yeah the whole country would benefit from more investment in the railways absolutely chris mckenna yeah for sure um for sure so at the key, th yeah, that, that's another point is that you can see who's paying for high speed rail group, unlike, I don't know, the Taxpayers Alliance or the IEA or the Adam Smith Institute, where it's very difficult to see who's funding it. So at least they're open about it. You, you can go and see exactly who's who's a supporter and who's who's funded them to, to keep things out. And the reality is that list times 12,000, it's a, it's a chunk of cash that don't don't get me wrong, I'd love to to have access to but actually it's not that much money they're not they're not doing huge amounts of dramatic lobbying you know it's just a few a couple of, of, of kind of office roles and a you know uh, and, a, and, a, and a boss and that's probably about it and, and then funding things like the green gauge 21 report anyway right i digress let us return to um modal shift matters and uh, so on and so forth let me close that window so Let's get this report open, shall we? So, uh, end of that. Yeah, go in. So, I'm trying to get to 10,000 subscribers. Oh, I just closed the page. But actually, I want to... Just before, before I completely forget what I'm on about, how many... About... How many subscribers do we have now? That's how many views. Well, that's quite a good number of views, though. Uh, how much do I have? Oh, here we are, yeah. 7.93 thousand. Can we make it to 10? God, if you don't subscribe now, which most of you do, but I'd love it if you could subscribe and get us to 10, because 10, apparently life becomes easier and the algorithm gets happy when you reach 10. And, um, uh, and it'd be nice to have, you know, like likewise, if you listen to this in podcast-only form, if just now, if you could, like, go into your podcast -y software, whatever that might be, and, um, uh, so, for example, if I do this in Spotify, you're all going to get, like, Spotify look it's my it's you're going to see my spotify and how i organize my music now uh no regrets so if i go into the rail matter thing uh i think i can provide oh i need to update this from not educational so whoever it is who's in charge of having the podcast access i don't think it is me i need to be able to get in this and fix it i can't remember how. But anyway you can provide a, re a, a review you, you can review where, i don't know where you can do this no not on follow following well you can follow it share no how do you do a review on here I have no idea. Maybe you can't on the old... Uh... Anyway, I digress. But anyway, if you're listening to Apple Podcasts or whatever, you can definitely go in and, and, and do a little a little bit of a, a review because the reviews on podcasting land also are good. We want to get we want to get more people listening to and um, watching Rail Matter. Come on now. It's, uh, it's all good fun. Uh, more people, the merrier, um, ultimately. So let's get this report up, shall we? Sorry, I've waffled. That's the end of that. YouTube, do the end of a chapter automatically and then we'll start the next chapter automatically. Thank you, YouTube. So here we go. And I, I'm going to first of all apologize. First, oh, I'll get this um, mouse showing. I remember to do that. Capture cursor. There we are. So you can see my mouse. So you can see what I'm wibbling around on. Uh, I apologize for the fact that they've set this PDF up to have slow motion, oh, slow motion page transitions, uh, which is irritating. Right, there's about high speed rail group. Fine, we'll forget about that. 
Um, and this is it's, it's not a big report. This one, don't worry. Uh, it's about thirty pages, thirty-five pages. Why modal shift matters. Uh, evidence on high-speed rail modal shift. Wider transport policy context in HS2. Forecast for HS2. Longer distance travel crucial for net zero. Some stuff about freight, cross-border connectivity between England and Scotland, uh, and the fact that modal shift is an objective from the start and the conclusions. So, interesting little thing to to have a look through. Um, yeah. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, let's see. Jack Elliott is saying, high-speed rail, bad. Flying to my nature park, good. Chris, probably. Oh, Chris Packham, in his defense, does make it transparent where his money comes from. Yeah, his money comes from... Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know how much money he gets paid, but he does get a lot of money for... Uh, he gets money for plugging his mate's uh, wildlife tourism junk. Uh, don't do wildlife tourism, folks. Uh, go and look at your wildlife that you can get to on a train or, or frankly, even in a car uh, locally. Uh, uh, go and walk bike drive uh if you have to but ideally get the train to look at wildlife don't blinking fly across the planet to go and look at other wildlife in the process of doing like soft colonialism and wrecking the local just don't do that come on um right we can forget the executive summary because we're going to go through the detail of it why modal shift matters um and it starts off the way you'll recognize and uh, this is a report uh, this is the first time i'm looking through it by the way uh, i think i've made reference to bits of it before but this is the first time i'm like actually going through it page by page so the fact that it starts with the carbon emissions thing is good because this, this, this is the thing that i i don't i'm not parroting this report when i make my case this you know this is in january 22 i've been making my case a lot longer than that but it's reassuring that it immediately starts with carbon emissions right so transport accounts for a third of uk greenhouse gas emissions uh, it's, a significant, it's, a it's a significant increase over 1990, um, which is the benchmark year generally for climate change calculations, when it was only 20% of the total. Um, it is the problem sector. There has been no net reduction in carbon from transport since 1990. Yes, this is stuff that I repeat all the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's talking about the fact that road transport accounts for 67% of um, uh, transport greenhouse gas emissions. That feels like a... Uh, uh, anyway, basically, you can see uh, there we are. There's, there's cars, there's international aviation, HGVs, vans. Um, in fact, if I zoom, I don't, I don't want to zoom in because it always screws up. There, it's fine. Yeah, let's, let's let's get this little graphic up. It nice and big on the screen, right? So you've got uh, international aviation and cars taking up an enormous amount of HGVs, vans. So first cars, second international aviation, and then you've got a lot of stuff. Domestic shipping, buses is trivial. Um, domestic aviation is is trivial. It's a really important point that, unfortunately, that, that is, is often a bit awkward, is that whilst it's a good idea to just get rid of uh, domestic flights, they don't actually account for the, a huge amount of emissions. It's the international aviation, the stuff that, you know, that, that when I'm going to Serbia, it's part, absolutely contributes to that. Um, or, or people flying further afield, uh, absolutely apart from that. And this, this is from Gillian uh, Annabel's uh, work for, for uh, Institute of Transport Studies in Leeds. Uh, and you can see other, the old other. Here's rail, 1%. Rail's emissions, this is a really, so this, this absolutely hammers back the other point about rail is that electrification is not about emissions reduction from rail. That get Absolutely get that out of your, out, out of your head. Hi, George. Uh, pleasure to have you in the chat. Hello, George Marshall. Um, uh, I did a sketch on Twitter recently about Manchester. You might want to look up, by the way, George. Anyway, rail accounts for a trivial amount. So electrifying is not about getting rid of carbon emissions from rail. Electrification is about getting rid of carbon emissions by driving modal shift because an electrified railway works better and carries more people or things. That, that's a really important point. I, I'm, you've all heard me, heard me make that point before several times, um, but this is a really crucial point to grasp. Um, actually, maybe you haven't made I've, I've made that a lot when I'm lecturing uh, for the PWI, but not necessarily. Shout out to the PWI, by the way. Shout, shout out to PWI. Hello, I'm wearing your, your lanyard because it's my work lanyard. Also, shout out to the TSSA. There, look, look at my TSSA thing on my thingy. Anyway, um, I'll just prove it. Look, there's, there's the TSSA there. Hello, shout out to the TSSA. And here's my, my lanyard. Yeah, fine. It doesn't say it's my. You can't fake it. Whether it's my, my little badge on the other back. I see you there. Yes, I'm easily distracted. What are you on about? So, sorry, I digress. Let's zoom back out and get on with this. So, that's a discussion of the kind of the split. Fine, okay. So, we know that. Um, and then there's a discussion of, like, you know, government's policy to decarbonize the transport sector centers on a switch from diesel, petrol to electric for cars and other road vehicles. Um, okay. Fine. So that's that's there. That's the that's laying out what government thinks it wants to do. Uh, DFT's transport decarbonisation report of July twenty one. We went through on a rail matter. Uh, also says it places a heavy emphasis on modal shift. It says this. 
noting that it is essential to avoid a car-led recovery. Yet, with the emphasis on electrifying the national road fleet of 35 million plus vehicles, it's easy to lose sight of the potential for consumers to switch their choice of travel mode. And the role that HS2 and related projects, including Northern Highest Rail, can play in helping to achieve modal shift passes unmentioned. Absolutely. It just doesn't, they don't mention it once. And you remember that from when we went through the, the transport decarbonisation plan. That plan, I'm sorry, is rubbish. It's rubbish. It's serious problems. Um, uh, Tom's asking, is there a way to calculate the CO2 required to manufacture batteries for electric vehicles? Yes. Um, uh, there's, the, the, it's about five, um, what is it? Five, what is it? Five tons? Five, yeah, it's about five tons of battery for a, for a, um, for a car. It's about five tons of CO2 per, per battery ish. Um, so you can, uh, yeah, you, but I did a thread on it on Twitter recently, Tom, so you can go and have a look at that. It's a hopefully a useful thread. Uh, if you search uh, my name, uh, search from colon, Gareth Dennis, space, uh, smart car, and you might get, you should get what the, the, the tweet thread. Um, there you are, an insight into my rapid fire ser- Twitter search uh, thread searches. Anyway, um, so there's a there's a the, 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 there's the the thing up here which talks about uh, this graphic here is from the transport. It's an adapted version of the transport decarbonisation plan. Um, uh, transport decarbonisation plan kind of th- projections. So it's looking at the fact that you've got um, some amount of, of, of demand reduction, um, but you've got an increasing amount of emissions of other, I'm not sure what, what other, uh, zero emissions vehicles, but they're not zero, obviously. Uh, HGVs expanding substantially uh, here. Um, and yeah, so there's, there's a lot of, so this is sort of saying what the, what the, what the reductions are going to come from. Uh, so this is residual emissions, and this is how they're going to get fixed. So this is saying that electric HGVs are going to come online from 2030. Hmm, best of luck. Uh, it's looking at uh, vans, electric vans from 2023, which, uh, yeah, they are starting to appear, maybe not as quick. I see DPD going around with electric vans around here. Fine. And then the idea that cars would just magically mostly kind of, you know, get converted over. So it's, it's, it's trying to suggest that that's how the, the magic... You know, mostly it'll be magical electric cars that'll solve the problem. As we know, this is uh, not the best way forwards, frankly. Yeah, exactly. Tim Ballum, wonder where they'll get all the lithium from for the required number of batteries. Quite. Uh, so, um, so this, the, the, the advisors, so the, the, the TCC, the Climate Change Committee, did the thing above, and uh, it shows how electrifying the road fleet is intended to, uh, it, it is indeed expected to have a major role to play. It shows that demand reduction will also be needed to meet our national targets, but it ignores the policy option of encouraging or simply embracing a switch from high carbon to zero carbon travel modes. This is a key missing element in policy. True, it requires behaviour change, encouraging and supporting consumers to make different travel choices to lower zero carbon modes of travel, which might seem challenging, but this can become an easy choice for people to make if the zero carbon option is more attractive. And of course, that is why HS services will offer quicker, more reliable journeys. Well, yes, but not the services it will offer. It's the HS2 will unlock that on the existing network mostly. So again, this this report, I think, is going to be slightly erring on the HS2, pure HS2 side rather than the... Um, looking to the, the the wider network, but okay, fine. So here is a picture, evidence on high speed rail modal shift. So let's have a look at some evidence. Um, yeah, uh, attendee of the live show, Pete, Pete, Pete J, are you out there? Um, this is the sort of thing that you talk a lot about on Twitter, um, and others talk a lot. David uh, Piello, Piel, Pielio. Oh, my name is. My, my mind is, is melted from lack of sleep recently. But the fantastic thread about modal shift uh, for and, and carbon emissions for HS2, um, a legendary thread that's well worth picking through. It's very long, but it's, it's a, a, a useful read. And this talks about air rail modal shares uh, and, and essentially, da, 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 okay, plenty of evidence, blah, 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 clear that this, 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 this that and the other. Let's have a look at, um, uh, yeah, let's see. So change in aviation passenger kilometers in uh, Europe and Asia uh, for uh, following the introduction of high-speed rail services. So you can see here, um, comparing, so so looking at, uh, there's two different graphs here, and then you're looking at Eurostar's impact on the London-Paris air, uh, air market. So you can see here that um, 
generally the, the aviation passenger kilometers percentage you can see that paris strasbourg is obliterated you know it's taken 80 percent out Ta- taipei to kaohsiung has taken out 80 percent as well 60 nearly 60 50 to 60 percent like paris marseille paris Lyon, seoul busan paris london Mar- madrid seville um brussels london and then you know so it's showing that there's been a substantial hit to um ridership you know beijing shanghai wuhan uh, guangzhou uh, all pretty sizable chunk taken out of aviation um uh, aviation sort of mode share uh, in the specific case of, of looking at london paris air market well they've got the the light line there is is france uk by plane excluding uh, paris london the red line is paris london by plane and the blue line is eurostar and you can see that well there's been a bit of an impact on the um uh, on the, the passenger ridership by air by eurostar uh, perhaps not much though because it's created journeys that might not have otherwise existed which is an important thing for for us to think about in this because it's not just you know the 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 ability to create um uh, yeah the, the ability to take uh you know, create new journeys is something that has to be factored into creating things like HS2 uh, and, and what the impact is. If it's, you know, the reality is if it's zero carbon or very low carbon, that's not a big deal. And actually, it's quite good to be creating new opportunities, and new journeys. But it is something to think about, because if, if that means that you, you're you not having an impact on those shares, you basically, you have to have the reason that that impact on aviation is not being hugely you know, isn't isn't particularly sizable is because there's been no policy mechanism to back up the benefit. You know, create the just the high speed rail, and then create punitive measures to 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 hit to, to hit air travellers basically. Uh, and we have not got we've got governments that are cowards who don't do that sort of thing. And um, so the potential for air transfer to rail in Britain has long been understood uh, as there's, there's, there's Jim Steer's uh, writing or whoever's written the Green Gauge Twenty One writing. This is a bit whiffly waffly. It's not like the most the sentence structure is a bit. You know, write more clearly. There has long been understood to be an S curve, or rather, what they should have said is, um, there is a, an S curve explains how modal share uh, between air and high speed rail evolves as journey times short. Well, what is this S curve? Well, it's this thing here, right? So this is showing this is the relationship. Oh, didn't want to do that. Sorry. Uh, the relationship between rail journey time and rail mode share versus aviation. So this is the response to the Union Connectivity Review. This is Network Rail's provision um, in, in, in the call for evidence looking at mode share um, uh, versus, so it's average rail journey time and uh, rail share of the air market. And it's saying that rail, um, yeah, rail share of the air rail market. Well, rail has the, um, Birmingham to London, pretty much it's 100% rail. Uh, Leeds, London, pretty much 100% rail. That's that's at two hours. So you can see as you, get, as you reach kind of beyond two and a half to three hours, mode share drops to about 50%. So as soon as you, that magic three hour mark is where you can capture 50% plus uh, air, you know, uh, of, of the modal share of those journeys versus air. So that's um, that's pretty, and then it gets down to being quite low, you know, 10% for the longer journeys. This is again where, so all of these could be helped a lot by bringing the bringing those journey times down and bringing them up this s curve right so this is this is just plotted and you can see a pretty rigid uh, s curve um, relationship between those so this is just network rail plotting mode share against um you know just looking at air and uh, rail not you know, excluding car unfortunately but just looking at air you can see that there's a pretty clear relationship and a lot of these would slide up that s curve if you started bringing the rail journey down so that that is the, absolutely the right thing that that hs2 can achieve um so you can see over the last um 15 to 20 years domestic air travel has continued to grow with additional services amounting to six airports serving london and the southeast rail services have been improved especially between northern english cities in glasgow edinburgh resulting in a growing rail market too this is a strong and building a strong growing base on which to build so you can see uh, blue there is uh, blue there is the east coast main line red is the west coast main line and uh pinky color is uh, glasgow and southwestern so yeah so you can see cross-border rail journeys between england and scotland by route so yeah interesting looking at um the different route that people take across across the borders uh, mostly people are traveling by the east coast main line in fact uh, not the west coast main line um to get across the border which is quite interesting but you can see overall those numbers are climbing pretty dramatically and in fact it's a reminder like the, the number of riders on the West Coast Main Line in the last, well, not in the last 10 years, but over the la- over 10 years, it's doubled. It's gone from 2 million to 4 million. 
right? That's an enormous <laughs> increase. Uh, like, uh, you know, on the East Coast mainline, actually, the, the percentage multiplier has not been quite significant. You've seen a, a four to five and a half ish. Um, but again, substantial increases there. Uh, I love the, I, I, and those substantial increases without any f real physical enhancement to capacity. Because this is after the completion of, um, you know, this is basically after the completion of the of the West Coast route modernization. So the reality is that that's that's just being squeezed onto the existing tracks and within existing trains. Quite dramatic. Um, great example of a city pair that demolished air travel is Barcelona and Madrid. Interesting. It's interesting you say that, but Barcelona and Madrid is rates quite low on this graph here. Um, so Barcelona and Madrid it shows only kind of about twenty. 2 23 24 percent uh, reduction in in uh, air market which yeah i'm not sure quite how that's from carbon brief so that is a good source carbon brief is pretty good data um uh, available so now the car question so this is an important one to have a look at high speed rail doesn't just reduce the need for short haul air travel it also has a clear impact on road traffic da, 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 da. so here is an example here that they've given which is looking at um, motorway traffic uh, growth um uh, and the effects of high-speed rail. So they look at three different uh, motorways in, in France. And yeah, let me just move this down here so you can see the numbers without my face being on top of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, remember to at me if you've got queries, uh, by the way, or thoughts or questions. Um, uh, Owen O'Neill was asking, how does that shape vary with price differential between modes? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure about that, actually. I, I think it's probably reasonably independent of uh, pricing. If you make it super cheap, though, it, it, I, I dare say cheapness is related to car rather than aviation. People who fly don't, give a, don't, don't really give a crap about the cost because they're probably on expenses um, or don't care. Whereas the people who are driving do care about costs. They're, they're, their choice is between petrol or you know immediate petrol cost versus say the train so i think these are the numbers that will be more impacted by by penny so the interesting thing here is um is uh tgv sudest uh and the impact are, so the southern and, and northern parts as you can see the impact so from the southern part opening you can immediately see the impact on on the difference so paris Lyon, the a6 which is the motorway that connects that, that does the equivalent of a tgv sudest um and you can see there's an immediate deviation and almost it just nips growth in the bud until you can see that there is a dramatic rise and overall just a climb because of the amount of extra overall mobility that's happening in France at the time. Um, you know, partly population increases as well. But you can see there's a huge difference because the TGV, you know, the, the, the original TGV route just, just dominates that, that, that market. It has a substantial chunk of the wheelchair. Um, so there you go. And then you can see um, the, the other two motorways climbing much more rapidly. So so. Uh, Paris Lyon motorway, the A6, uh, much lower because of the presence of the of the TGV. So, uh, high speed rail has an impact uh, on traffic levels on parallel motorways. In these earlier cases, there was a flattening of motorway dem travel demand growth. As with air travel, there is clear evidence of modal shifting from car to high speed rail. Fab. So, let's have a look. The wider transport policy context and HS2. Fine. Um, a recent network rail survey has shown that while two-thirds of the public recognise rail as a greener mode of transport, 73% still primarily use cars to get around. There you go. Um, switching to The switch to electric power is creating very cheap motoring for those who can afford new electric vehicles and for whom home charging is feasible. Um, it's a strong, if selective, pull factor. Uh, talking about ultra-low emission zones uh, as well and just general policy pushes to, to make these changes. Um Da, 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 da. So yeah, they're, they're talking about the limits to change in travel behaviour and the fact that uh, Manchester has consistently rejected good travel policy. Uh, people they just, um, but you have to have the the network first. People have to feel like they have an alternative, otherwise they all push back. Which is fair enough, to be honest. I think build the public transport and the and the active travel opportunities first. Um, uh, it's talking about some of the you know uh, road. It's talking about the fact that that, that increasingly road usage is offered at zero cost. Uh, and in practice, road use cannot continue to be offered at zero cost to consumers for two reasons, um, which is as fuel duty drops away, HM Treasury would lose around 40 billion a year from fuel duty, big hit. Um, and number two, uh, that is uh, any reduction in motoring costs, such as cheaper per mileage costs with electric vehicles, incentivizes more road use, more private car travel, leaving aside the adverse safety and wider social environmental impacts of more road traffic, even if electrified. This means more road traffic and economically damaging road congestion. Absolutely. 
Fine. So, so when, as would seem likely, government introduces wider, possibly national rule, user charges, the introduction of HS2 services could be a great facility to have available as an alternative to more expensive journeys by car. Exactly. We have, to, as I've been pointing out, we cannot imagine that the, the policy status quo is going to continue to exist. It cannot. We just cannot let it. And we need to have the infrastructure ready for people to, to, to be able to travel in, in different ways. Otherwise, funnily enough, we're going to impact the, 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 the least well-off in society are going to be the ones who end up not being able to travel. And it'll just be the well-off who can continue doing business as usual, which is why I push so hard to provide these opportunities and, and, and alternatives. Um, so, uh, anyway, there's, there's lots of discussion going on. Um, I, I know there's lots of you who are big EV fans uh, in, in, the, in the chat and, and others of you who are not. I just remind you all, um, electric vehicles solve, and they don't really solve it, but they only solve one issue fighting against cars and against car dominance and car dependence is absolutely crucial for us to have a viable future um absolutely critical so modal shift forecast for hs2 well okay hmm, test time let's see because these within the analysis as dave p found david p found in his in, in his mighty thread on, on on these numbers the analysis for modal shift was rubbish absolutely rubbish um so uh let's see so this is looking at the, de the developed forecasts um published figures on modal shift to hs2 are small and as we will show misleadingly so so they're doing the same job they're pointing out that the, that the mode shift uh, is rubbish indeed uh, these are indeed the numbers that emerge from the model so uh, right even hs2 limited suggest only one percent of hs2 travelers would otherwise fly and only four percent would have driven yeah so this is a gibberish this is nonsense uh, oh, that's a quote from Walmart. Uh, shout out to Christian Walmart. Hello. Uh, these are indeed the numbers that emerge in the models. So here, uh, so we seek here to understand why these proportions are so low. Indeed, much lower than than those experienced on Britain's only operational set of H, uh, uh, high speed services on HS1, where four million out of the four, 26 million domestic and international travellers carried annually had switched from cars and flights. Uh, an overall modal transfer of 15 percent. Uh, the demand model used in HS2 business cases, Planet Framework model, PFM, is well established and is owned by DFT. It is an all-day model and therefore takes no account of peak period travel conditions. Right, there's some really nerdy stuff. Owen O'Neill is watching this. Um, uh, yes, um, it's, it's well, this is the sort of, this, Owen, this is your, this is your, your, your as, as a pig to a, a mud pit, this is the good stuff for you. Um, Tim Ballon pointing out, the economic case for roads is built upon a, a throne of lies. Someone taking 20 minutes extra to work has no real economic uh, impact. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. So, um, uh, yes, so here we are. Right, lovely. Uh, what was this being said? Uh, 18, da, ba, da, ba, ba. Oh, this is saying so. Blah blah blah. The applicant. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, the HS. Uh, uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm just, uh, as the HS2 full business case makes clear, the model assesses the extent to which HS2 and the associated capacity released attracts new demand. Although the potential for additional services on the existing network, which are made possible by the release capacity, is not reflected in PFM. As I've said this whole time, when I say HS2's main benefits are not modelled, that is what I mean. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. They don't model release capacity benefits at all not modeled it's a really important thing when people are saying oh hs2's business case doesn't stand up that doesn't stand up the main benefits of hs2 the 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 main benefits of hs2 i'm saying this for the benefit of the youtube d d subtitler the main benefits of hs2 have not been modeled and do not form part of the business case they do not form part of the cost benefit analysis really important to understand that um so for specific city pairs, projected impact of HS2 uh, uh, when it opens is much greater, as shown in Table 3. So this is showing um, with and without HS2 um, uh, looking at mode shares. So HS2 enables mode share between London and Glasgow to jump from about 50% to 70%, um, uh, taking air out down to from, from half to almost a quarter. Um, uh, London to Edinburgh's uh, mode share is already very good, actually. Uh, Airs is, is, is dropping out. Car is quite low already, so the benefit on the East Coast mainline is not great. That's because LNER service is really a very popular. It's a very popular service. It's pretty fast, four and a half hours. Um, anyway, so lots of information there. Lots, lots of extra data about about. But the key thing is there's another there's another underlying issue with the demand model used for assessing HS2, which is the projections of modal shares are for a design year 
in the mid-2030s to examine and contrast with and without cases, which requires background projections of how demand for each travel mode is likely to change between now and 15 or so years hence. For these projections, DFT has standard guidance which reflects current policies. Um, of particular relevance are assumptions on rail fares and private car operating costs. Rail fares are assumed to grow in real terms at RPI plus 1%, but fuel prices are projected to fall dramatically in line with government's expectations of a rapid take-up of electric vehicles. So they're assuming no punitive policies to encourage modal shift, uh, which at the moment, to be fair, is accurate. Um, conclusion. Uh, well, in summary, the published uh, modal shift numbers used in the HS2 business case are not a good indicator of what is likely to happen in practice when HS2 services start up. The 1% from air and 4% from car numbers are misleading because their mode shift expresses percentages for travel across the whole nation, not just the corridors where HS2 services will operate. The possibility of additional services on the existing rail network made possible for it by HS2 um, uh, are yet to be properly investigated. Three of the four models used cover journeys of less than 50 miles where modal shifts are not separately identified. And uh, point four, the data available on car travel understates long distance journeys that would be attracted to switch modes if high-speed rail is available. Um, it's also the case the published mode shifts are much smaller than has taken place upon the introduction of services on high-speed one. Um, the assumptions made on prices for rail and car modes over the next 15 to 20 years assume increasing rail fares and reducing driving costs. So yeah, when the focus is drawn more tightly around where HS2 services will operate, um, significant modal shift occurs. Um, so there you go. So that's a key, a, a key fundamental reason why all the analysis for HS2 is a load of bollocks. Uh, Michael C on that on, on a similar subject is asking why do you think the East Coast Mainline has done such a better job of con of cornering the market than the West Coast Mainline just because the East Coast Mainline is usually less crowded or right big face time a few reasons for that number one uh, more people uh, tourist travellers want to go to and from uh, Edinburgh so a huge volume of traffic kind of goes that way but also in terms of the types of workers that are on you know in places like uh, Edinburgh Newcastle York and the the approaches into london those are all quite high uh high skilled job sources lots of consultants lots of people who make those bus that business trip and also uh even though the west coast mainline is arguably the west coast mainline is arguably the jewel in the crown of of the british rail network in terms of long distance services actually by far the fastest way to get to edinburgh is on the east coast mainline and that makes a difference you know the fact that it's four and a half hours on a on a on a on the services that are perceived as 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 cheaper and more competitive uh it's a clock face service it's a more straightforward like it's a on the on the face of it a, a more visible um service if, if you're in london and wanting to get to scotland lner can, it provides the lion's shares share of, of 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 the quickest you know it's, it's the quickest way to do that journey um uh, the west coast mainline goes to edinburgh but it takes longer you know it's, it's a longer trip um so uh yes it's um so it's by yeah so so the, you know the the it, it dominates the the that the mode the, the, the for journeys between london uh, and and scotland the east coast mainland absolutely dominates um so uh right let me go back to my miniaturized face longer distance travel is crucial for net zero um that's the next chapter uh, longer distance trips of over 50 miles account for under two percent of the trips people make but nearly 30 percent of their travel mileage it's travel mileage that's relevant when it comes to assessing carbon emissions absolutely because carbon is per mile right it's not it's not per journey it's per mile it's a really critical point which is why you get a lot of people saying oh but you know long distance trips are only a tiny amount so why do we care about those we should be putting bike lanes everywhere well a put bike lanes everywhere that's a good thing because you're undermining car dependency which means that people won't own cars which means they generally won't make they'll make a different decision if you haven't got the sunk cost fallacy of having a car and therefore only thinking about the petrol then you're going to make different decisions anyway so build the bloody cycle lanes that's a good thing anyway for lots of reasons number two um it's all about the fact that it's not about the number of journeys it's about the miles that people travel so um uh, for longer distance car journeys the alternatives to petrol diesel are not quite so suitable as those for short and medium distance travel uh, battery power for longer journeys requires a huge investment in rapid charging systems uh, hgvs and coaches adopted technology might be hydrogen rather than batteries but both technologies worsen power to weight ratios um uh, yeah when highways england and network rail look together at what each route uh, each mode could do along the southampton west midlands corridor in july 21 they concluded that rail is more cost effective than road over long distances and for high loads well we knew that anyway didn't we by by a, by a long way um so uh yeah here's an interesting one so this is oh 
no, don't do that. Where, where have we gone at? I'm holding control because I want... Oh, why are you ignoring... Oh, I know why. It's because I, I alt-tabbed out. Yeah, here we are. So, um, annual... So this is a distribution of trips and trip miles by journey length, annual per capita mobility in, in England. So this is looking at trips, the majority of trips, you know, a good chunk, are, um, let's see, what is this saying? Uh, annual per capita mobility, why is it saying minus 65%? I don't fully understand that. Uh, trips, I don't fully get what this graph is saying, actually. Who's, who's watching? It's, 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 this is saying 46% minus three. trips. I have no idea. This is a really bad graph. It's not It's not communicating anything very clearly. Who's, yeah, I'm not, I, I have no idea what this graph is saying. Uh, I think it's possibly saying that, like, lots of trips, but not that many miles. I think it's trying to do the balance of trips versus miles, but it's just not doing it in a very clear way way I, yeah not not don't like that graph that's bad graphs that's a that's a lib dem graph right there um so here is um the the the, the percentage uh, of trips and by what means so if you have a 50 to 75 mile trip mostly a car and then as you got to 350 miles plus the air is taking up a sizable chunk of that rail is in blue uh, bus and coach is, is pretty level to be honest right the way through but you can see air starts getting got hungry 350 plus miles yeah, but 250 sorry 250 to 350 rail uh, is still doing pretty well but mostly it's still cars it's still cars bad this is bad some analysis done by sistra so um yeah you can see that's the defense of of, of, of on, on on travel distance and then freight um the UK will become the first country in the world to commit to the sale of zero emissions heavy goods vehicles. Uh, lol, good luck. Uh, by 2035, the all new HGVs sold in the UK to be zero emission by 2040. Again, lol, good luck. Um, so, um, da -da 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 -da. there's, there's some, some general feedback. While what is not remotely in prospect is a viable alternative to diesel in a 44-ton HGV. So that's basically the standard HGV, which is a 44-ton HGV. There is no viable alternative to that. So, yes, good luck with that. So they're to look, to looking at, like, trials of electrified motorway lanes, which, as we've discussed before, is kind of not that sensible an idea. Um, looking at f hydrogen fuel cells, which might be actually better because it avoids the lithium. I know people are saying hydrogen is bobbins. Yes, it is. Um, but it's potentially less bobbins than digging all that lithium out of the ground. So um, the reality is the best thing to do is to just get rid of 40... Get rid of 44-ton HGVs. Get rid of them. They're gone. And then you do all the logistics for 44-ton HGVs on rail, and then you distribution centres with smaller vehicles that can be electric um, at the end of the journey. So the only viable future, although government refuses to admit it, is you get rid of the 44-ton HGV. And the benefit of that will be that you might offset all the additional otherwise, all the additional other loading that you're going to get on bridges, highways bridges across the country that are going to be falling to bits because of all this, these hugely heavy battery SUVs that everyone's buying nowadays because the the tonnage the annual tonnage on roads across the country is going up very dramatically and it just means all of our bridges are going to fall to bits uh, US style and perhaps banning the 44 ton truck might go some way to ameliorate that impact um, more on more on how we do some of this stuff for the future um, how plausible is that future for freight well uh, yeah, see, see Matt see my discussion as, as as I've just said someone asked a question a minute ago it's gone uh, George Marshall how do we present a viable alternative for road upgrade schemes from, Man like, from Manchester to Sheffield like the, the, the Mottram bypass could HS2 help with this would people be prepared to change at Birmingham Interchange uh, I mean expanding rail there's supposed to be one billion quid spent on hope valley uh where's that gone uh so just just yeah rail expansion works it drives modal shift if you invest in rail you drive modal shift so more modal shift investment is a way to provide viable alternatives but also it's like don't do the road upgrade scheme just don't do it right just, just don't do the road upgrade scheme and then you won't create you won't induce traffic so it's both. You've got to do both. You've got to provide the, the viable alternative. But in the meantime, don't do the road upgrade. Just sack the road upgrade off entirely. Um, 
so anyway, lots of stuff. There are changes in the in the logistics sector favoring rail more again. So and actually, you know, Simon will back this up as well. Lots of others. The freight industry is crying out for more rail capacity. It's the fact that we're as an industry, the rail industry is not providing it. So it's a it's a, it's a big problem. Um, uh, rather more than one third of all HGV uh, ton kilometers make up a realistically addressable market for rail over the next twenty to thirty years. So nearly forty percent of road journeys could be could be, you know, HGV uh, moves could be by rail. But the rail industry is not providing that capacity, and the lack of HS2's eastern leg is hitting that severely. Um, in the absence of a viable zero carbon HGV, an emerging new model of logistics is to trunk by electric rail and distribute by battery truck. Oh, that's what I just said. That's what I just said. Hooray! Uh, there we go. So, marvelous. Um, Argyle, yes, SUVs are the absolute worst. Yeah, we just don't need them anywhere. So. Oh, uh, Victoria Amori, um, Aomori, sorry, Victoria, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Aren't most of the goods demands uh, next day or near deliveries? Is there a locomotive that can perform faster acceleration? Uh, I mean, yes, electric uh, is good for that. And you can do overnight logistics quite easily with that sort of stuff. And indeed, certain companies are currently trialing that for Amazon, um, uh, providing rail logistics for Amazon. That's happening now. But also some of that behavior change is that we're going to need to accept that it takes two days to get us our treats not one day uh ladies and gentlemen uh boys and girls non-binary people of all ages getting our treats in one day is probably not very good for the environment and we should stop doing it that's my little my little secret for you all um uh yeah alexander roderick saying that most goods deliveries aren't next day to commodity speed doesn't matter consistency does um do i know the price difference oh people have asked me this before about the price difference in tonnage between rail and road very difficult to give a straight answer on that um it's definitely cheaper by road uh for sure every time you do a change of, of thing from one mode to another you introduce costs so if you can get an HGV from like you know your Tesco lo your local Tesco you know the Sainsbury's local over there to um to to the big t distribution center whereas it would have to go by rail then buy a small thing with a change then you're introducing costs but if you have to do that anyway because all the towns have got low emission zones then you ameliorate that cost but it's very difficult to compare them um we also need uh, very uh, far fewer treats uh, yeah correct we also need fewer treats um so uh, when I say treats, by the way, if those are not steeped in uh, trash feature lore, lore, I'm talking about all of our gizmos that we buy off, off of the internet that we want. Like, I just p bought a pair of uh, laces from my Converse's because my laces have snapped. Uh, those, to be fair, I got in, in three days, but uh, I could have got one-day delivery on those. To be fair, I didn't realize that I hadn't got clicked the one-day delivery. I'm as guilty for clicking one-day delivery just because it's free and we, and we have Prime for telly. So it's like I'm as guilty as, for it as, as all of us. Um uh, Victoria Aomori, is there a standalone locomotive other than diesel that can perform as fast as electric? No. Can diesel locomotives perform as good as electric? N no. Uh, no. Electric is just absolutely wipes the floor with all other alternatives um, completely. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing horribly. Uh, store up these questions, but remember to at me so my name appears in red for questions. I might miss your question otherwise. Um, uh, let's store these up because it's uh, 1953. I want to wrap this up before the hour. So uh, there we are. A bit of a discussion of HGVs and, and some of the benefits. You've got some of the flow, the daily daily freight flows here, which are quite nice for us to look at. It's a bit of a JPEG image, sadly, but there you are. That's quite a nice little um, showing the different flows that exist and the fact that you've got you know up here in in, in between, kind of up towards southern manchester and, and that area on the west coast mainline then southwards so basically that's from crew south to where it splits up to go in all different directions around the west midlands and then across to other parts is some of the densest um goods flow in the country is there and then of course there's the the joke that we have uh, single track connections to felix Stowe, as i pointed out trash future and all this all this good stuff um uh, that was on the recent recent episode, by the way. If you're not listening to that, it's a bonus episode. Well worth subscribing to listen to it. Um, so uh, yeah, it's the fact that West Coast Mainline remains kind of Britain's freight backbone. So there's a major freight benefit by HS2. So yes, there's uh, you know the release capacity of, of the Eastern Leg would have also benefited the Midland and, and East Coast Main Lines and all the freight flows there, um, in in both directions, both kind of crossing additional capacity from reduced number of crossing moves over the east coast mainline but also kind of parallel and, and kind of on east coast up and north south capacity on the east coast mainline so um yeah what is that is it daventry uh da, 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 da. oh anyway blah, blah blah lots of additional uh huge amounts of additional um capacity would be released by hs2 
Um, but also, we just need much more rail capacity for freight. We're just, we, we, our capacity and our ability as an industry to deliver f- uh, new freight services is, is really not good enough. Um, so to summarise this freight uh, diddle, uh, 40% of HGV freight mileage could be replaced by rail freight. Modal shift is, an, uh, is as important, perhaps of greater importance in the freight sector than for person travel, for people travel, uh, and can make a significant contribution to national carbon reduction emissions. Indeed, it's unclear whether, whether as of today any viable alternatives exist. It's a really key thing to think. There is no replacement for 44-ton truck. There's no zero carbon replacement for it other than rail. So my, my view is you get rid of them. They get banned. Gone. Um, uh, it has to go to either either that flow ceases to exist or it moves by rail. That that's how I would do that. Um, yes. So, da 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 da. North of crew accommodating additional freight can be achieved by a set of measures including lengthy freight loops. Uh, yeah, but uh, ideally not. Ideally, you'd create a, a fast paralleling bit of railway. Uh, then the, the next chapter, uh, Anglo Scottish connectivity. Yeah, we've had a look at the kind of this, and and we're looking at Scottish policy on high speed rail here. While the expansion of direct air links has dramatically improved Scotland's international connectivity in recent years, air travel is making a growing contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Da, 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 da. Um, so this is a big red box, which I think is like a bad news box in this report. Um, cross-border road and rail links are of prime importance and congestion can, uh, and lack of infrastructure out with Scotland. Um, oh, Scott has written this because out with is a Scottish word. Out with Scotland can have an adverse impact on access to Europe and other parts of the UK. Fine, lovely... Um, Grand. Any discussion of borders here? No, no, no. Fine. I don't really know what the point of just a general policy summary. I think Scottish policy on rail at the moment is fairly crap. They haven't got a clue what they're doing. Um, I know like there are some good things happening in Scotland, but the reality is they're kind of happening by accident. The reality is that the Transport Scotland uh, and the Scottish government have made a real bodge of the rail policy, and they, they, there's a serious series, uh, a really painful series of missed opportunities in Scottish policy. Um, you might be going, oh, but they're doing so much better than England. Yeah, sure, but grass is always greener. And the reality is that like it's frustrating when opportunities that could be taken are missed and also they're basing their transport proposals on some very large whopping big um uh, some enormously whopping big uh misunderstandings of what t- decarbonization is and is for uh, i'll do a rail matter on that actually i think uh it could be a fun one so fine uh look there's the there's a discussion of like london scotland air mode uh, air rail mode share as a function of uh, rail journey times so here we go zoom in on this so Air's uh, mode share at the moment is a, about 70%. Uh, rails is 30%. If you reduce the journey times down to three hours, that situation better than flips. You know, rail can consume more than 70% mode share, up to 75%. It can, it can go from uh, about a third to three quarters, um, which is, is pretty impressive. So that's that's what we should be aiming for. So that's the idea. If you make if you get a, a, a Scottish Central Belt to London journey time of three hours, which merits building high speed rail the whole way, um, that is is worthwhile for that 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 mode shift for those long distance journeys alone, which is good. So, uh, modal shift was an objective from the start. Here we go. So uh, fine. The drive to net zero has undoubtedly risen up the government agenda laterally through the UK's presidency of COP26, but sustainability has been a central aim of the HS2 project since its inception. While some critics may seek to suggest they were first told that HS2 is all about speed, in fact, reducing carbon emissions and modal shift have been consistent themes throughout HS2 development. Who will you re-examine the definition of high-speed rail objectives when HS2 was initiated? Blah, blah, blah. So this is a bit of a... This is one of my threads, basically. Um, if we look back in 2007, is a question that went... Um, uh, that's um, in the Transport Select Committee, in fact. Um, but you have not given us anything for the future beyond that, have you? Uh, question mark. Uh, what I have not done is give you a list of projects. I tried to build a transport strategy and talk about what the priorities are because to give you a list of projects would have taken a lot more time than I had. What I tried to do was provide a set of criteria against what future projects could be based on. I made the observation, given the timescales, that making best use of existing infrastructure is essential to getting us where we need to go, but by itself is not enough, that we will need to make what I describe as some substantial investments to ensure that we can meet the transport needs of the country beyond 2015 i was quite clear about that um so you accept that the things we have both been talking about should be done by 2015 lol uh, uh, there's a painful irony uh, that was back in 2017 anyway um uh, i think the national audit commission said that by the time the west coast mainline uh, by that time the west coast mainline would be full to capacity uh, it was and in fact it got full to capacity before that so anyway um yeah, the 2006 Eddington Review um, pointed out that we needed to have new transport infrastructure to provide capacity where it was needed to facilitate economic growth. 
didn't mention high speed rail explicitly, but um, he did make that kind of need fairly clear after the public report was published. Uh, oh, and it continues. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Mr. Eddington is saying, looking at very long lead times, I, if you agree a transport strategy and that needs to be pressure tested, advisors advise and governments decide. So the government should decide whether it accepts my findings or not. And if it can therefore deliver a transport strategy, then we that uh, we then need to think about what it means in the most congested corridor. By the way, we're going to look through the Eddington report, which is good uh, in a rail matter. It's well worth digging through, I think. Um, right, so da-da-da-da-da. Getting to the crux of that discussion from the Transport Select Committee, there is no doubt to me that it... This is Sir Rod Eddington saying, there is no doubt to me that in the most congested corridors, and you have spoken of them, and as you said, it is London, Birmingham, Manchester, or is it is... Uh, um, and beyond, there should be a strong business case for trains in those corridors. That business case will live or die based on its strength, in my judgment. And when I talk about investing in success, I'm talking about investing in places where congestion charges are greatest, whether it's road or rail or port or airport. I mean, I'm sorry, Sir Rod Ellington, your answers are really waffly, but you know, political appointments and such. Just be explicit and say it. But again, it's like it was managing the fact that government wanted to announce high speed rail and he didn't want to. It's probably the dynamic in that situation. But yeah, there's a, there's a, an excerpt that I use actually with, from the original Network Rail report that pre-HS2 network rail report which explicitly says about release capacity on the existing rail network um, so da, 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 um, yeah I'm not going to pay attention to Greek Gauge 21's fast forward report um, let's see is it going to have the network rail quote here no it's the command paper um, which is about congestion. First sentence in a two-page summary of its assessment of why high-speed rail is need, needed reads. The government's assessment is that over the next 20 to 30 years, the UK will require a step change in transport capacity between its largest and most productive conurbations, both facilitation and responding to long-term economic... Facilitating and respond... That's a mistake. Uh, facilitating and responding to long-term economic growth. Lol. Um, fine. Are they going to... Oh, they don't put... Annoyingly, they've missed a trick there. They've missed a trick of the network rail report, which explicitly states... Um, the, uh, actually, I downloaded that recently, didn't I? Yeah, shall we find it? Let, let's find it, shall we? Uh, let me go big face while I do this. I made the mistake last night of accidentally not big facing um, something that I ought to have big face. Where is it? It's in uh, Light Rail Railways Act. Uh, is it in this one? Yeah, it's my history of privatization. Where is it? If, can I, is it in here? Is it this one? No, that's the Railways Act itself. Um, let me see. I'm find this damn thing no that's the damn that's the bloody delivering a sustainable railway that said no to electrification i wonder summary brochure ah here it is yeah uh right good i think this should be it let me go small face again this should be a case for new lines uh our railways are full fine blah 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 solutions passion numbers blah blah blah, blah. capacity end of next decade yada yada um fine Answer to capacity conundrum, new line to the Midlands, north, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. Nah, fine. Uh, you, uh, is this the... Oh, this is this is like the summary report, so maybe it doesn't actually say it. This would be ironic, isn't it, wouldn't it, if it talked about this. Uh, at this stage of the study, no lines have been drawn on a map. It's just too early in the development of a scheme. Um, a typical uh, timetable might be... Oh, look, they do draw a line on the map, lines on the map. But look, they do this. Um, fine. Oh. Lovely. The benefits. Here we are. What are the benefits? A new high-speed line to the Midlands, northwestern Scotland, will represent a transformation in travel experience between these key economic regions. Some of the benefits include very quick journey times, um, lots of extra seats per hour into London, um, lots of revenue generated and benefits. Uh, analysis of the new line studies use the value of time saved uh, the, uh, by passion on the existing route and the reduction in overcrowding. Also, the value of additional freight paths created on the existing route and the value of the reduction in congestion. Fine. No, this isn't actually the report I was looking for, um, because the report I was looking for is more... You know what? I'm going to find the damn thing. It's worth it. Uh, net, uh, network rail new lines. Oh, funnily enough, I've done that search before, because I've gone new line pro lines program in. Um, there we are. Oh, that's the same one. That's the same one, everyone. That's no good, is it? I think... I wonder... Yeah, the... That's not... There is definitely one that is explicit about the fact that the new the benefits to a new line are uh, uh, why not connect to Leeds in the northeast oh yeah that's right they do give some of the questions there um 
not network rail, but perhaps a similar consortium as to that which came together to build HS1. This is network rail talking about, about this thing. Um, what about the government-created company High Speed 2? The new line study started some six months before the creation of HS2 and thus has an, had an advantage in the detail of its modeling and analysis. All this work has been made available to HS2 to help them do their thing. Yeah, fine. I'm sure there's a story. Maybe this is the thing, and I just can't flicking find the thing. Definitely, the release capacity benefits are explicitly written in it because I quoted it. Anyway, uh, I give up on that and stop waffling. Also, I've downloaded it twice, which isn't particularly useful to any of you, is it? Uh, right, anyway, let's continue. Let's continue our, our journey through these slides. Fine. Conclusions. Uh, yeah, compel it. Well, what are the conclusions? You know, we, we've got, they've, they've said their thing, only HS2, fine. Um, it's the only possible to expect large scale modal shift by a new ice speed line, of which HS2 is the new ice speed line. So, fine. HS2 will also release capacity for conventional rail service, including freight, blah, 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 marvellous. Yeah, we know all this good stuff. So, what are our thoughts, everyone? Uh, what are we thinking on, on this on this empty little discussion? And also send your questions, which I'll answer at the end. Uh, lots of discussion here. Uh, people saying things. Uh, fine. Ah, Socialist Democrat had a quick look uh, for uh, AT... Uh, Three euro cents per ton kilometer up to a distance of 100 kilometers and over 100 kilometers, one euro cent uh, for rail, I suppose. I don't know what the comparison is for road. Anyway, right, fine. A waffle. Let us. Um, hello to everyone in the, in the chat, by the way. Store up your questions at my name so they appear in red. What are my thoughts overall? Um, I've hopefully explained modal shift in a, okay, in a, a national transport context. I've not talked about modal shift in a local context there. Um, I, 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 I realize this. Um, um, but I think that's uh, the, the kind of the point of this is a, a long distance discussion, really, because that's the real benefit to, to carbon emissions. Uh, modal shift locally is is it's frankly well not necessarily more complex, but it but it, it could be and can be more complex. I think. Um, so uh, that's all that good stuff. Um, I will do the outro bits and answer some questions. I think so. Uh, get it in my face and say uh, in audio only format yeah as ever all good podcasting platforms this audio is available and it's in your ears right now uh, last week's episode I've just converted so sorry last week's episode is, is late it'll go up with this one probably at the same time I'm sorry if uh, sorry if I um, uh, if I uh, have been late with this the, the latest one I'm sorry about that um, uh, oh nice that's exactly the image in fact, is that image, that looks like the image that is from my tweet, um, uh, Michael C. Thank you. Yes, it is in the executive summary. Uh, you know what? I'm going to find that damn thing. Let's go big face and, and, and distract myself from my... Uh, no, that's not what you want. You want uh, downloads, because I just downloaded it again, didn't I? Uh, ba -da -ba -ba. Executive summary. Oh, uh, oh. It's an executive summary. I th I think possibly... Not quite sure which. Anyway, like I'm, I'm waffling and, and I can't find it. I'm gonna. It's the quote is. I'm gonna take the quote and uh, and pop it into. I'm, I'm doing it. Wait a minute. You know, this is rail natter, so it's gonna be chaos. This is just how it works. Come on now, you know how this goes. Uh, I have a. Yes, it is the long. You're right. It is the full new lines program. Um, uh, and I've found I found my thing that I need. Uh, good. I'm gonna put it in here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is this is. I'll put it in before the. Yeah, let's go in here. Oh, what? D -d 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 there. Come on. There. Boom. Layout white. Fine. I'm editing on the fly. Thanks, Michael C, for sending that through. Uh, those numbers I just quoted are the Austrian subsidy for single wagon traffic, not cost of rail freight. Thanks, Xander. I was uh, taking comments on the in the YouTube chat out of context. It was all kicking off in there. Anyway, right, I digress. So, uh, oh, I've done that wrong as well. I don't want that to be there. I want that to be here. Fine. So, oh, audio only format. Please uh, like, subscribe, and, and do reviews. That makes a big difference to the algorithm if you do reviews and put stars and stuff on it. So, any, everyone watching this, particularly the Patreon people, if you do that, it'll help bump the episode, the series, and that'd be really nice. Thank you. Um, Patreon.com slash Gareth Dennis. Hello, Patreon lovely people. The more Patreon subscribers have appeared recently, and uh, I, I love you all. Um, thank you so much. It helps this to exist. It, it, it's time consuming. I have to do this in amongst my day job and in amongst increasing amounts of cool stuff that I can't tell you about yet. Um, also, a baby. The baby is coming imminently. 
Uh, I think the next one, the next episode, as I'll tease in a second, is, is going to be the last live one for a little while while baby's here. I'll be taking a month off. Um, PayPal.me slash Gareth Dennis to throw me uh, loose change and comments and uh, abuse, all of those things, very welcome. Uh, Gareth Dennis to UK slash Discord for the YouTube chat to continue uh, as ever it does. And the Discord server has like a thousand people in it and all of you are lovely. Uh, Pete Johnson, oh, I'm glad you're watching. I hoped you would. Uh, hello, Pete. Shout out. Uh, check page eight of the executive summary at the bottom. Yes, I, I've, 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 I've grabbed that. Actually, I've grabbed my own screenshot that I was sent by Michael C. The, twit, the, the tweet that I did taking the, the pit bit of the executive summary out of the, um, the New Lines program report. Anyway, um, and here it is. Here is that extract, as if by magic. Executive summary, and here it is. Uh, the key aim of the New Lines program is to meet future needs for additional rail capacity. A new line will provide additional capacity in two ways. Number one, through the provision of capacity in the new line itself, and number two, through the associated release of capacity in the classic rail network, which I've underlined in orange. There you go. An orange. Right, uh, talking of orange, next week, the last live episode before, I mean, in theory, it might just go to hell and be a disaster, or I might pre-record it if I need to. I'm, I might do a backup pre-record. Maybe I will do a backup pre-record, uh, just in case. Um, uh, Jack O'Hooke is also saying, uh, shout out for trans rights uh, for the new law that passed today in Finland. Absolutely. Um, trans rights are human rights. Um, shout out to our... Uh, trans siblings um episode 152 how britain's post-war intercity rail network should have looked this is going to be a fun one it's going to be my birthday so we're going to have some fun uh oh yeah it's my birthday oh fine i have a rail network on my birthday why not um unless dina particularly wants to spend the evening with me but I, I, she'll I, I'll, I'll ask her if she wants to spend the evening with me i will do it as a pre-record but anyway maybe it's worth doing as a pre-record just in case but it will also be fun to have your interaction with it I'll have a think on that. But in theory, this is the next episode, which will be a fun look at how Britain's rail network, what the intercity main lines should have been if we took a more pragmatic look at what direct lines serve which locations and if we had paid less attention to the to the the, the grouping structures of, uh, and indeed the pre-grouping company ownerships of railway lines. So uh, it's not my birthday today, it's my birthday next week. Um, <laughs> yeah, for next week. Yes. Um, so, um, so that should be fun. Uh, it's going to have maps. It's going to be a, a. It's going to be classic rail matter fair where we're going to dig around in maps with on Google Earth. Zoom in, zoom out. You can shout at me. Um, we can just have a general look at fun stuff and think about what could have been and what might have made more sense. And it's taking a bit of a, a scientific diagrammatical look at, uh, at what the rail network ought to have looked like. And let me tell you, the the map looks different to what it does now. Um, so uh, yes. Um, that that should be fun. Yes, that's a, a rather gorgeous picture of a. Uh, what is that? Is that an eighty one at speed? It's a class eighty one. Anyway, it's an electric blue and it's gorgeous. So that's next week's episode. I'm gonna get my big my big old face up. Get me face up, and then we'll uh, yeah. Penboy happiness for next week. Thanks, uh, thanks Gareth. Thanks everyone. Um, will this link to the APT episode? It's an early happy. Oh, it's an early happy birthday. Uh, will this link to the APT episode? No, no, not really. It's more about the physical network and, and about what perhaps I mean, we might touch on, on APT, but it's a it's a maps it's definitely a, a maps uh, it's a maps episode. Uh, Map Men Edition when asks Adam Evans a uh, good question. Uh, put me in touch with them and we'll make it make the magic happen. Um, uh, let's see. So questions that are coming through. Uh, Pete Johnson, check page eight, the exact summary at the bottom. Yes, I think that's what I just covered. Zandovich, yep, they corrected me on that. Michael C, it's an executive summary. Uh, Jack Okuki, when assessing the economic slash political case uh, for infrastructure investment, are the different modes assessed using the same metrics? Mm -hmm. Kind of yes, and therefore kind of no as a result uh, it's a bit of a weird but that's partly related to the fact that assessing them on the same basis often is not a very good idea um actually pete johnson in the chat is on twitter it can provide a really good answer for that if you're on twitter tw kind of tweet him because he and owen o'neill as well but um making the assessments for cars versus rail the the the, the way the assessment is done not very good um we're not very good at analyzing them um we really are not very good at analyzing the uh proper mode share right chuck more of your questions in this direction george marshall um will this be about how hs2 should have looked no that's another episode i will do an episode on what i think hs2 and, and britain's high-speed rail network should look like whether that episode is also simultaneously the pro mega projects britain needs to do and how it should deliver them or whether it's just looking at how i'd have done hs2 differently uh, i've yet to decide but there's definitely quite a few um different uh 
kind of uh, different episodes related to, to, to the network there that I think are, are well worth exploring. Peter Hicks. Pogs is here. Peter, hello. Hello. Hello, Peter. Oh, we'll do a pre-record, uh, Peter, which we'll hopefully do um, to add to my pile of um, pat leave pre-records. It'd be lovely. I'm looking forward to having you. Um, very excited about that, in fact. Um, I would love to see a Matt Men episode. That would be excellent. Yeah, I should message him, shouldn't I? Uh, yeah. Uh, Victoria Omori is asking, will our trains ever cross the Irish Sea like ever? Often people go, it's a stupid idea, why would they do that? But my response to that is, is it that stupid an idea, given the... If we go back to our Irish Crossing episode, is it that stupid an idea? Because it's one of Europe's busiest aviation corridors, and I think connecting people over what is not that great a distance isn't, isn't a bad idea. It's maybe worth doing. So, I yeah, I, I, I'd like to hope it would happen, actually. And, and I would be going for the Irish Mail route, I think, was the one we'd agreed. That, that episode, we, we did a scientific process to work out which is the best route, right? Go back to that episode, whenever it was. What, what episode was it? God, I don't know. Let's have a look. Episode... Uh, Ireland. Ireland. Irish. Ireland-y. Uh, uh, no. 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 Uh, episode 33. Yeah, there it is. Episode 33. So we can find uh actually you know what? Let's just remind ourselves of episode episode thirty th- no episode thirty three uh, which is this one. Yeah, this episode. Uh let's do that and then I can go no face. Yeah, this episode. Uh episode thirty three would have fixed link to Northern Ireland work. There we are, that's that's the episode that uh the episode that uh, you can go and watch for that one anyway right uh, that, that's enough of that um you've you've I've, I've emptied you of questions um i will see all of you um sometimes oh go on gregor mccabry uh if we did more actual multimodal studies there'd be more logical decision making absolutely and for me that was a big missed opportunity of the union connectivity review we should have had modal share and and the ways we're going to change it and, and we haven't um uh yes anyway right enough of me waffling everyone have a lovely rest of your evening Cheerio!